Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville Fiber, the Giga City Company, Fiber Internet, HD and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Mallor Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching in Indiana and around the world. Education.indiana.edu. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. The Radio and TV News Endowment, a fund established by listeners and viewers to sustain reporting of Indiana news. More information at indianapublicmedia.org slash support. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. So that means you talk to us. That means you engage with us. You are accountable to us. Bloomington's mayor says the city made mistakes in the way it handled the controversial purchase of an armored vehicle. Coming up, the mayor joins us in studio. The three Republican candidates in Indiana's Republican Senate primary squared off this week for their first debate. There were a lot of jabs and name calling, but some talk about policy. Luke said yes, and we still don't know where he stands. I would not have voted for him. Thank I you. I would have been with, uh, and you should have uh, gotten that by uh, how I stated it. We'll have a recap coming up. For nearly a century, Indiana has prohibited carry out Sunday sales. When could that change? Plus, how a new cellular network is making it easier for emergency responders to get to emergencies. These stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. Some Bloomington residents are still upset about an armored police vehicle the mayor and police department want to purchase. Activists shut down Mayor John Hamilton's State of the City address over the vehicle last week. Now, at a meeting earlier this week, Hamilton admitted his administration hadn't worked closely enough with the public before purchasing the Lenco Bearcat for the Critical Incident Response Team, or CERT. And people at that meeting were angry over the vehicle and the way the administration handled it. This vehicle takes nine months to build and it's a custom order. So I want to know why it took um, nine months of us not having this conversation and why we're only having this conversation now that the, the purchase has gone through. Well, and Mayor Hamilton joins us now in the studio to talk about the uproar caused by the new vehicle. Thanks for joining us. Mayor, you say, though, it's not an uproar, it's more of an event, but there are a lot more events. There are about three of them still scheduled for next week, and I'm just not sure where this is going, where this discussion about this vehicle is going. What, what do you hope that these three forums, what will the result be? Well, it's going to continue to be discussion about a very important topic. Public safety is a deeply important topic to everybody. I mean, we see examples that hit us emotionally from around the country uh, and and every day we know we have dangerous people who are doing bad things in our community and making sure that our public safety officers have the right tools i think everybody agrees on there are different views then about what those tools are and that's what this discussion is about and it's not surprising that you know there's a lot of national dynamics that can affect us here my focus as mayor is trying to make sure we have the right tools deployed the right way with the right training to protect all of us from the for the safety that we want. Council Member Steve Volan published a letter, I assume you saw it this I have week, seen it. Um, yep. recommending running the vehicle through the whole city council process. So stopping everything and kind of starting over again. Is that on the table? You know, uh, Joe, I can tell you today, here's, here's what's going to happen next, I think. We have, um, we've, we're going to have a total of five public sessions to talk about this. Two have happened, three more coming next week, at least. There may be more, I don't know. Uh, I have indicated that by the end of March, I will come out with a plan going forward. After hearing all that input, um, including from city council and others, to, to do what I think is my job, which is to try to make sure our public safety people have the right right stuff uh, and have the right training. Uh, at the end of March, uh, when we come out with that uh, plan, then uh, there may be, City Council may want to weigh in and do some things. I may ask City Council to do some things. Um, 
Uh, we may ask the Board of Public Safety to do certain things, um, but let's, let's take a breath, um, give a few weeks, more public input, and then we'll come out with a plan at the end of March. The other issue, as you've mentioned before, is the transparency. You've already mm -hmm. apologized mm -hmm. for it a couple of times, but how do you move forward from this in terms of not only keeping more transparency with the public, but those within city government? Well, I'm committed to transparency, and I deeply believe that the more the public knows about the police, the better we all are. And the more the police know about the public, the better we all are. And all these events that we're having now, these discussions, are a big, good part of that kind of transparency and getting to know each other better. All right. The police do a great job, and um, the more the public knows about what they do, the better. And the more the police know about what the public want, the better. We're seeing more of that. Mayor, we have to leave it at there. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Good to see you, Joe. And those upcoming meetings are scheduled for Tuesday, February 27th at 5, then later that day at 6.30 p.m., and on Thursday, March 1st, from noon to 2. Now for headlines, we go over to Barbara Brozier, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. Indiana's Attorney General is one of several who met with President Trump at the White House this week to discuss improving school safety in the wake of the shooting in Florida. Curtis Hill says leaders should be focusing on properly equipping schools to prevent and respond to threats. He says Southwestern High School in Shelbyville is a model for school security. In addition to bulletproof doors and glass, the school is also wired directly to the Sheriff's Department. Each teacher has a key fob so that when something occurs, they can communicate effectively and immediately with someone off-site. And the most Do you have anybody inside with a gun that can well, take on the man that's right outside the door that, by the way, can shoot right through the steel doors as they did in your school? Well, those bullets went right through those steel doors like they were butter. That's a part of what's, that's a part of what's necessary, but I can tell you this. What else they have are countermeasures. Hill says those countermeasures include smoke canisters, which the sheriff's department can deploy to distract the attacker. Hill also says more states need red flag laws that allow them to take guns away from people they believe to be dangerous. Hill says Indiana is one of only five states with a red flag law. Local representatives of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America say they'll work to pass stricter gun regulations in Indiana. Following last week's school shooting in Parkland, Florida, the group hosted a meeting in Bloomington. More than 200 people attended, hoping to spur change. As part of our platform is Moms Demand Action supports the Second Amendment, and we feel through common sense legislation we can change the epidemic of gun violence that our country is facing. The group plans to focus its immediate efforts on the state house before shifting focus to the midterm elections. The stroke of a pen is all that separates Indiana from legal Sunday alcohol retail sales. The state Senate voted this week to send the governor a measure eliminating a Sunday sales ban that stood since prohibition. The governor will likely sign the bill next week. Once he does, it will immediately take effect. Now, it was originally supposed to take effect July 1st. The change means liquor stores aren't sure exactly when they'll have to open on Sundays for the first time. A bill that would allow students to carry and apply sunscreen at school is awaiting the governor's signature. Some legislators questioned the need for the legislation, but some schools require a note from a doctor or parent in order to carry sunscreen. The bill would lift those restrictions. It's among the first measures to make it to Governor Holcomb's desk. A group of Bloomington DJs is trying to start a conversation about sexual violence at bars and clubs where they work. It all started when a couple of them started talking about inappropriate situations they saw while on the job. They wanted to know how to help. This isn't the type of crowd you're used to seeing at the Bluebird in Bloomington. When you're DJing um, in that type of context, we started having conversations about like, what could you do? This is the third bystander intervention training the Bloomington DJ Alliance is hosting, along with Middleway House and Indiana University. And it's geared specifically toward performers. This is not because of, you know, we saw one bad thing happen and we need to change it, but it's really just because this is something that we should be doing. DJs are in a unique position to help. They're often set up above a crowd, allowing them to see what's happening in the audience. When you play two or three times a week, I know I'm gonna see things that are gonna need to be dealt with. 
So I just honestly wanted to know a few tools to help myself with that. The training focuses on how to identify sexual violence and different strategies for intervening. It even includes role-playing exercises, allowing DJs to brainstorm how they might respond in different situations. For DJs to say this is happening um, in alcohol serving establishments right in front of me in public spaces between people that know each other and we're seeing it and we just haven't named it yet or we haven't felt empowered or capable or like we had the tools to name it. I think that's really powerful. It makes people think, why are DJs so concerned? Um, is this happening around me? Should I be concerned? While the target audience is performers, the trainings are open to the public. The next one is in April. And Joe, as part of that effort, they're trying to get some mentoring going on where DJs who've been through the training can mentor other newer DJs and really just change the culture around some of these venues. It's really a new angle on preventing assault. Uh, thank you, Barbara, for doing that. Mm -hmm. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. We'll travel to an Indiana city that's the first in the state to join a nationwide cellular, cellular network that will better equip its emergency services. Monroe County has a rich Olympics history, a tour of an exhibit showcasing Hoosier athletes. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. The WTIU WFIU news team connects Indiana to the world. We bring you the top news of the day on radio, TV and online. We round up the stories that have people talking each week and dig deep into the issues that affect your community the most. The WTIU WFIU News Team is where you are and telling your story. Ten thousand. Fifteen? Fifteen, do you think? Twenty. Twenty-one thousand? Six hundred. Twenty. Eighteen five. Twenty-four. It's at least forty. Look, yeah, look at 4, it. Forty-five hundred thousand. Six fifty. Twenty. Six fifty. This textile would be worth about a half a million dollars. Half a million? No way! I knew it. It's just a blanket. Laying on the back of a chair. Well, sir, you have a national treasure. Wow. A national treasure. Congratulations. I can't believe this. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Indiana's U.S. Senate race is expected to be among the most competitive in the country this year. Republicans are hoping to unseat Democrat Joe Donnelly, but they have to get through the primary first. The three Republican candidates met in their first debate this week. As Barbara Brozier reports, much of the focus was on their opponents. Representative Todd Rokita set the tone for the debate from the beginning, taking aim at his opponents in his opening statement. I also want to welcome my opponents tonight. Mike, welcome to the Republican Party. Luke, welcome back to Indiana. The jabs didn't end there, although the target changed depending on the candidate. Representative Luke Messer focused his attention on Democratic Senator Joe Donnelly. Joe Donnelly talks conservative when he's back home in Indiana. And he votes in Washington with Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and Chuck Schumer and Barack Obama 85% of the time. And former state legislator Mike Braun called out both of his opponents for being Washington insiders. Who do you think looks more like Donald Trump? It's an outsider that's done something in the real world. I think that picture is clear. The discussion did shift to policy, where the candidates talked about the need to permanently repeal and replace Obamacare and what areas of federal spending they would reduce if elected. But the discussion got combative again when the moderator asked Rokita and Messer about their votes on a recent federal spending bill. It provided military funding, but increased the deficit. Messer voted for it, and Rokita voted against. It's the choice our commander in chief gave us. And he could have been no clearer. He, choice. he could have been no clearer he said about he what he asked us to do. Because that's what we sent him. Braun also defended a vote he made while in the state legislature. He supported raising the gas tax to generate funding for infrastructure improvements. I know in my own district it was over 70 or 80 percent of my constituents said fix the roads. This week's debate is the first of several ahead of the May primary. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Barbara Brozier. And with us now is political analyst Laura Wilson. Laura, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having uh, me. 
Why is this so important, this race? Well, this is seen nationally as one of the most competitive Senate races. Obviously, for the Democrats, they want to be able to keep this seat. They need it. They're still a minority in the Senate. For the Republicans, they see this as one as they can flip. And you have two very strong competitors, arguably three strong competitors for the Republican primary that are all seeking to compete against Donnelly in the fall. So it, the debate earlier this week, that they did share some ideas. Um, did, did the candidates really distinguish themselves among one another? For a 90-minute debate, yeah. the biggest thing was the spending bill. And that was one of the things that Barbara mentioned. Um, this was something that Messer had supported, that Rokita was against. Um, both of them are traditional Republican arguments. And Messer said, I supported it because the commander-in-chief wanted me to. It's support for the armed forces. Whereas Rokita said, I'm not going to be voting for something that's going to raise the deficit and money we don't have. And of course, we had to mention Braun. He wasn't voting on that because he's not in Congress. But he said, ultimately, he would have sided with Rand Paul and also not voted in favor. Now, what about money? Of course, spending money is a good indicator, usually, of who's going to win. What's the war chest like of these candidates? It's neck to neck to neck. So we're looking at 2.4 for Rokita and Messer. Uh, Braun is just slightly behind with 2.3. A lot of it's his own money. But then if you're looking over why, like overall comparison with Donnelly, he has about 5.3. So no doubt, early money is helpful. They want to win the primary. That's the only way they go on to compete against Donnelly in November. But there's money is very important in this race. So, yeah, you mentioned Donnelly going forward. Are these candidates... What, what, I mean, first they've got to win the primary, but they then do. what's it going to take for them to then actually move forward to, to try to defeat Donnelly? Well, the challenge is going to be appealing to Republican voters in a relatively Republican state, so being pretty conservative in the primary and having that kind of ideology, but not going too far extreme because they want to come back to the middle for the general. And Donnelly isn't a terribly liberal Democrat, which makes sense. He's representing the state of Indiana. So they're going to have to pivot themselves between May and November if they want to be successful. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank you. it. Well, the state recently handed down its final 2018 budget order for the city of Terre Haute. As Taylor Haggerty reports, the order asked the city to reduce some spending, but it's much less than initially thought. The state initially told the city to cut more than $2 million from its proposed budget, but the final order only tells the city to cut roughly $290,000 from its motor vehicle and highway fund. That's much different from last year when the state told the city to make nearly $9 million in cuts in order to eliminate a deficit created by years of overspending. The city has a plan to completely eliminate that deficit by the end of 2018. The plan relies on extending a controversial loan with the City Redevelopment Commission and appropriating funds from areas operating at a surplus. Mayor Duke Bennett says Terre Haute balanced its annual budget for the past three years and 2018 should be the same way. 15 was our toughest year and so ever since then we've been making some pretty significant progress and it's just it's time to, to, to be able to talk about that in a positive way and communicate that on a regular basis. Bennett says the reduced cuts come after the city provided more up-to-date information to the state on projected revenues and expenses from recent months. He says the city will appropriate funds from other areas to make up for the $290,000 cut. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Taylor Haggerty. Well, if you've ever tried to make a call at a busy sporting event, you know how jammed up the cell phone network can get. Now imagine having that problem if you're a first responder trying to get in contact during an emergency. A nationwide cellular network aims to solve that problem. It's called FirstNet, and the first city in Indiana recently announced its emergency responders will join the network operated through AT&T. Lindsay Wright is here with more, but it's a bit more complicated than that, Lindsay. Yeah, networks, data, these are things most of us use every day through our smartphones or tablets, but don't think much about. But first responders also use cell and radio networks, and they become congested, especially during large-scale emergencies. One tragic event in particular led responders to realize they needed better communication tools. Terrorist attacks on 9-11 required assistance from thousands of emergency responders. And one thing became abundantly clear. They couldn't really communicate all that well. 9-11 created and awareness. And the 9-11 Commission report came out and said public safety needs expanded bandwidth and their own bandwidth. Um, and so that was the, the push to get there. Over the years, government officials worked to improve radio systems for first responders and FirstNet efforts launched in 2012. 
The 25-year project gives local agencies priority on an AT&T cellular network. Governor Eric Holcomb announced Indiana would opt in to the deal made with AT&T. Opt out meant that if we did not accept the state plan, the state of Indiana had to come up with its own plan and not only address the technology that would be needed and build it out across the state, but also uh, accept all the financial responsibilities that, that went with it too. All 50 states opted in. The city of Noblesville is the first in Indiana to join the FirstNet network. On the surface, the goal is simple enhance communication between emergency personnel. It's almost like a separate cellular system. So here's the public cellular system, here's our cellular system. And we get priority. So it will drop the public before it drops us. Here's how it works. The more people using a cell tower in a particular area, the more congested it gets. And it can only handle so many concurrent users. Emergency responders are fighting for space on the network as well. FirstNet assures those responders always have space, meaning they have priority over public users. Fire Chief Greg Wyant says it made sense for Noblesville to jump on board for a few reasons. We're already using AT&T products across the board as a city. There was no reason to wait. They're, they're ready for us to sign on. Let's do it. So we did. But the Noblesville-Hamilton County area also draws significant crowds regularly. There's Connor Prairie and the Ruoff Music Center. In the summer, this lot is jam-packed with vehicles as music lovers crowd into the venue. That alone can cause capacity issues, even if it's not an emergency situation. Concert goers will frequently stream live from a concert. That takes up a lot of bandwidth with a lot of people doing that. So it, it it really decreases the capability of, of other people being able to get on the network and use it. AT&T is investing around $40 billion to add new cell towers across the country. But costs for local agencies should remain comparable if they already use a cell plan. Noblesville Mayor John Ditzler says under FirstNet, the city won't need any additional funding. There are no additional tax dollars going in to, to get this benefit. Um, our rates, if you will, with AT&T are what they were, uh, but we were just fortunate enough to get this added benefit and, and would hope that others would follow. Only a handful of cities around the country are participating in the network so far. Vice says it's going to take time for some agencies to transition. He says communications equipment can be a pricey venture, and for some, it may not be the priority right now. There's a number of agencies that, that don't pay for um, cell phones now for their uh, public safety people. If they're not doing it now, they're probably not going to jump onto this right away until they can figure out a mechanism to pay for you know, those opportunities. But officials say agencies need to get on board for the project to truly succeed. If we have people that aren't uh, participating in the system, we lack interoperability. So this, uh, this has been a process. It's like anything else in government or in public safety. It's a process, right? Um, and we're getting far along in the beginning of the process, but we're still in the beginning. So, Lindsay, you said in the story, 25 years to complete this project. What does that entail, and is it really going to take that long? Well, we're already six years in because Congress passed this effort in 2012. But officials say this isn't just about a public safety cell network. It's meant to be a breeding ground for innovative ideas focused on public safety specifically. But... <clears throat> um, how to use advanced smartphone technology, for example. You know, you and I use mobile applications like, what, Twitter, Instagram. But first responders could also use mobile apps that could help them in emergency situations. So it sounds like ideas like that could play out over this process. So they've done a lot already in six of, well, the 25 years. I guess what's the next step now? Over the next few years, new cell towers and antennas are going to be built, built out. Um, the federal government is contributing about $6 billion to help with increasing communication efforts. But state officials say one of the benefits of this being a public-private partnership is the FirstNet network can be used now. There are currently cell towers up. 
So um, over the course of time, there will be enhancements and new investments to that. All right, very interesting. Thank you, Lindsay. You're welcome. Well, if you're sad to see the Winter Olympics coming to an end, you can relive some former moments at, of glory at a Monroe County exhibit. Their sports gallery features seven local Olympians like ice skater Jill Watson and swimmer Jennifer Hooker. Bob Hamill was on the committee that spearheaded the creation of the gallery. He says the exhibit can help connect people to their community. The one thing that we added, we hope to do with adding sports, was to encourage the traffic. We want people to come here. We want people to see what we have here. Hamill says they hope to expand the gallery in the future to include more Monroe County Olympians. That's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville Fiber, the GigaCity Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Mallor Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching in Indiana and around the world. Education.indiana.edu. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. The Radio and TV News Endowment, a fund established by listeners and viewers to sustain reporting of Indiana news. More information at indianapublicmedia.org slash support. And by WTIU members. Thank you.